Hi, welcome, and thanks to everyone joining us today from Portugal, Canada, Argentina, Brazil, Scotland, Australia, Italy, South Africa, and all around the world. I'm Naomi Murakawa. I'm the author of The First Civil Right, How Liberals Built Prison America, and I'm moderating today's conversation. Before I introduce Ruth Wilson Gilmore, I want to thank the organizer and sponsor of this teach-in, Haymarket Books. Haymarket is the publisher of a new series called The Abolitionist Papers. I'm the series editor, and I'm proud that the inaugural publication for the series is Dr. Gilmore's forthcoming book, Change Everything, Racial Capitalism and the Case for Abolition. Haymarket has three more important events lined up this week. On Sunday, the launch of Krista Franklin's Too Much Midnight. On Wednesday, a discussion of remaking schools in the time of coronavirus with Wayne Out, Jesse Hagopian, and Noliwi Rooks. And on Thursday, a week from today, Arundhati Roy in conversation with Amani Perry. Just a bit of housekeeping. With so many people joining this call, we may need your patience if we have any technical issues. If your stream gets choppy at any point, you might want to try reducing your image quality. This video will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel. And we are reserving time for Q&A, so please post your questions on the live video feed wherever you're watching it. Now let's go. Arundhati Roy tells us that the pandemic is a portal. It forces us to break with the past and imagine the world anew. Some responses to COVID-19 foretell a future that is only doubling down on criminalization, the policing of national and subnational borders, and even more surveillance now sold to us with the message that total surveillance is good medicine. But as we try to imagine a different world, and as we fight for our abolitionist future, there is no one I'd rather hear from than Ruth Wilson Gilmore. She is the co-founder of many organizations, including California Prison Moratorium Project, Critical Resistance, and the Central California Environmental Justice Network. She's professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at CUNY Graduate Center. Dr. Gilmore is the author of Golden Gulag, Prisons, Surplus, Crisis, and Opposition in Globalizing California. It's a brilliant study that locates prisons as the foundation of a new kind of state, the anti-state state, where elites dismiss the idea that government can or should guarantee social well-being. Her work has been featured in dozens of journals and books, including Versos, Policing the Planet, edited by Jordan Camp, and Christina Heatherton. And her new book, Change Everything, Racial Capitalism and the Case for Abolition, is forthcoming with Haymarket in February 2021. Thanks so much for being in this live stream, Ruthie. Thank you for having me. With COVID-19, many are pointing out that detention is death. Can you start us off by giving us the bigger picture on the relationship between prisons and inequality? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, my dear friend, Catherine McKittrick, who I think is listening from somewhere in greater Toronto, recently cited the fantastic poet and lawyer, M. Norbeza Philip. Norbeza said, if we were truly all in this together, we would not all be in this together. And this is a message I think that we can use as our starting point tonight in talking about COVID-19 mass incarceration and the struggle for abolition. Mass incarceration and the related forms of detention that uh, connect to it is a feature of places that have the deepest inequality, the deepest inequality. And we have one slide to show you tonight um, a slide that shows a list of the founding nations of NATO. Now, this slide, which was created by the Prison Policy Initiative, perhaps the greatest data collection, visualization, mm -hmm. and spreading organization in the United States and one of the great ones of the world, shows us that even in the context 
of the NATO of NATO's founding organizations, the United States is off the chart, mm -hmm. quite literally off the chart. And what holds this together? What holds together the possibility of mass incarceration in the richest country in the history of the world is a combination of organized abandonment, which is to say austerity, and organized violence, which is to say criminalization, policing, prisons, detention, deportation. Now, we can take the slide down if people are, are um, satisfied with its image. We could, but we're not going to tonight, also look at images from the BRICS, that is to say from Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And we would see a similar pattern emerging where no one, no country is remotely close to the United States, but as Russia and uh, other countries of the BRICS have followed increasingly neoliberal policies, which is to say the policies of organized abandonment, the policies of austerity, we see the number of people locked up rise and rise and rise. Mm -hmm. But as I said, the United States remains off the charts. That said, abolition actually is not a recitation of catastrophe or a culture of complaint. Indeed, catastrophe and complaint, if that's all we do, are the kinds of practices that induce in many people who are listening what my friend, the historian Daryl Scott calls contempt and pity. Mm -hmm. And abolition is not looking for contempt or pity. What we are doing rather is this. We're trying in every possible way to find a way to politics that rather than being distinguished by, as the sociologist and novelist Edouard Louis says, uh, politics distinguished by style, we're looking for politics that really are grounded in the struggle over life and death. So Edouard Louis is a French, young French writer, and he wrote a fantastic book I recommend to everybody called Who Killed My Father? And it's in this book that he makes this distinction, politics as style as against politics as life and death. So what does politics as life and death mean for abolition? Well, abolition is presence. It's already happening in so many ways, in so many places around the world. And many of the people who are listening in tonight and watching tonight are already doing the work and are stumped as many of us are because so many of us are under some version of shelter in place slash house arrest and yet the work continues. Now, CLR James teaches us that revolutions happen because people are so conservative, conservative. He says they wait and wait and try every little thing until one day people come out in the street and clear up in a matter of years the disorder of centuries. Now when Arundhati Roy says that COVID-19 is a portal, this might be the portal through which people who are doing all kinds of little things Mm -hmm. of various kinds around the world come out and clear up the disorder of centuries. My uh, friend and comrade Ayana Maria of Rust Belt Abolition Radio lifted up a mention I made the other night of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense motto, Survival Pending Revolution. And she thought and named a discussion that a few of us had on abolition, Rust Belt Abolition Radio the other day, um, that we could think of what we do as survival pending abolition. Mm. Survival pending abolition. So that means that the work behind and the work ahead is very, very long. I'll give you an example. Um, in Los Angeles County, decades ago, 
the ACLU brought a conditions of confinement case against the county for the horrendous conditions in the jails. Over the years, the ACLU was in charge of, of, of taking care, uh, keeping an eye on what the county did to remedy the horrific conditions. About 18 years ago, the ACLU invited a few abolitionists to come and talk to them about something they had never imagined, which was perhaps the way to remedy the problem with the LA County jails was not to have a jail at all, rather than to build a better jail. Slowly but surely, this way of understanding became central to the struggle in Los Angeles County over those jails. 16 years later, abolitionists who joined forces with the forces of reform managed to persuade the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, one of the biggest governments by number of people in the United States, not to build new jails, but rather to put the billions of dollars that would have gone into that, into housing, health care, and other life affirming projects. So abolition is long, abolition is presence. Abolition is how we connect with, form, grow from, and multiply organizations that have the capacity to lift the movement. I learned from Vijay Prashad many years ago that our main work, we who are talking heads sometimes on Skype, our main work is to lift the movement, not to lead it, to lift it. To lift it by showing how anti-domestic violence people are central to the formation of abolition uh, as a movement. That mutual aid organizations, which are now flourishing everywhere because of the emergency of COVID-19. That unions, food, healthcare, nurses, building trades, all of these organizations have become in one way or another connected with the movement in the direction of abolition because abolition is about abolishing the conditions under which prison became the solution to problems rather than abolishing the buildings we call prisons. There are faith organizations, neighborhood organizations, artist organizations, tenant organizations, prisoners organizations, inside and out, libraries, environmental justice, legal aid, transit workers, rights advocates, public health advocates, bail funds, you name it, large and small. All of these people are coming together in various configurations around the world to try to relieve the stress of organized abandonment and its realization as organ through organized violence by changing the world in which we live. So that is the big picture that connects inequality with abolition and mass incarceration. Okay, so here we are, decades deep in organized violence and organized abandonment, and now enter the COVID-19 pandemic. What are the political possibilities now and what might the pandemic mean for the future of criminalization, police and prisons? Well, certainly the pandemic is focusing everybody's mind. There's nothing like fear to focus the mind. And the fear has uh, many, many aspects to it. And therefore the responses that people are putting together are um, in many ways quite astonishing. Uh, for example, um, just to take one uh, very pointed uh, case, some uh, people, I think mostly students at New York University Law School, put together a sheet, uh, a guide for 
uh, all of the state jurisdictions and the Federal Bureau of Prisons in the country to show who actually has the authority to release people so that people uh, who are organizing on the ground could focus using this power map on those who could in uh, a brief amount of time make the decision to release people. Uh, what we know about mass incarceration is that it is class war and it is as class war very tightly knotted to the vulnerabilities that the types of organizations I listed a few minutes ago and the kinds of organizing they do are trying to relieve. Labor unions are trying to relieve certain kinds of vulnerabilities as are housing advocates, as are prisoner rights advocates, as are people who are incarcerated who are advocating on their own behalf families, communities, and so forth. We could spend some time perhaps uh, thinking about the fact that in the United States, over the period that mass incarceration has become this catch-all solution for a wide array of social, economic, behavioral, and other problems, the number of prison beds has gone up as the number of hospital beds has gone down. That the, the, the movement in the opposite direction is quite startling to me. And as many people have pointed out, those who are against and those who are for, the um, configuration of hospital and healthcare in the United States today, we still see the fact that many, many areas of the US are underserved if served at all, places that have the capacity to take care of people are overwhelmed because of the of cuts to hospital and health care. And the workers who are uh, working in hospitals, working in transportation, working in all of the sinews of the system to try to keep people whose lives are in danger from becoming sick and dying are struggling with inadequate resources when the resources could be there. So what can we think about in terms of organizing now? Certainly a lot of the work that uh, many people have done uh, concerning rural workers, vulnerabilities, should and can be lifted up now. Whether we're talking about the MST in Brazil and the landless workers who have been organizing for years, both to have access to land, to produce food and well-being and to live and have shelter, but who have also built an enormous um, educational program for themselves and others that has uh, very strong international connections throughout this hemisphere and indeed around the world. Or in the U.S. South, the Highlander Center, which in Tennessee since the 1920s has been a central place for uh, uh, organization, anti-racist, pro-working class organization. And they will have a, a program on, I think, right after we log off tonight, starting at seven o'clock on the Black Freedom Movement, seven o'clock Eastern time. Um, similarly, when we think about housing, I, I, I can give a fantastic story about a young abolitionist artist called Sheena Griffiths, who's based in New Orleans. So after Katrina, destroyed a good deal of everyday life in New Orleans. And then the anti-state state came through and destroyed what hadn't already been destroyed by the floods and uh, the rot. Shana and some of her comrades got together and said, we are going to create a housing trust so that a few households at least could have a safe, secure, and pleasant place to live. So they knock themselves out learning, learning how to make a trust, how to take land out of the market, 
found the place they wanted to buy, raised the money to buy the place, did all of this, all the paperwork. And when they were finished, what Shana Griffith had to say about it was, we did do this. We helped ourselves. And this tells me that the state we need is the one that will do this. We actually need that state that belongs to us rather than think that we can do this ourselves for each other. We need the pro-state state, not the anti-state state. Other possibilities with respect to COVID-19 connect with the various kinds of things that people are doing immediately to try to get people out of prison and jail or to look after people who have gotten out who are vulnerable because they uh, need shelter or food or other kinds of um, uh, sustenance. So there are bail funds that have sprung up around the United States. They aren't new with COVID-19, but they are more urgently, of course, uh, reaching out and raising money. We know that in Cook County, in Chicago, uh, Shayla Grant and uh, the the comrades that she has been working with over the years have done an enormously wonderful job getting people out of Cook County jail. This is a good thing to do. And yet we also know that in the last four weeks, 22 million people in the United States lost their jobs. That means the need couldn't be greater for people to have the wherewithal to pay rent to buy food and so forth. There's less, as we say, discretionary cash available to help out with a bail fund. And therefore, like Shana Griffith discovered in the work that she did in New Orleans, we have to make demands on the social wage, which is our right and our requirement of ourselves. From around the world, there are examples of uh, artists such as the Mulheres de Pedra in Rio de Janeiro, radical educators here in uh, Portugal, Plataforma Ghetto, the Detroit Justice Center, the uh, people who've been working with Mi Gente, uh, working on behalf of uh, undocumented people, long distance migrants all over the United States, Cop Watch in Frankfurt, uh, disability organizers whose work has been so beautifully pulled together by Liet Ben Moshi, uh, people doing work on food, the Uptown People's Law Center, also in Chicago, Men, 